lecture and introducing the wonderful Dr. Jan Till, paediatric cardiologist at the Royal Brompton Hospital, who, who is a leading authority on all things channelopathy and devices. Her long term, her long standing Eva um, inherited arrhythmia family service is, is an exemplar um, when it comes to service provision. So we now look forward to our talk on sudden death in the young. Thank you, Jan. My goodness, Bethan. Um, <laughs> That was quite an introduction. Um, right, let me um, share. Please um, shout if you um, if you can't see these. So thank you very much, everyone, and thank you for asking me to talk this afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk on the subject of sudden death in the young. Um, and of course, I'm going to focus on sudden cardiac death. And the definition of sudden cardiac death is death as a result of an underlying cardiac disease occurring within an hour of the onset of symptoms or an unwitnessed death where the decedent was well 12 to 24 hours before because many of these deaths are unwitnessed. And you need to exclude the other conditions that can look a bit like um, a sudden cardiac death, pulmonary embolus, cerebral pathology, etc. And the toxicology, of course, needs to be negative. This happens only too often, um, and the incidence has been estimated to be between 1.3 um, and up to 8.5, although I think that's a little high, per 100,000 persons uh, per year. So, um, sorry, persons. A significant proportion um, may be precipitated by underlying inherited cardiac conditions, and, and that is where um, we need to focus our attention. Sadly, sudden death may be the first manifestation of disease in the decedent and or the family, so it is a, a terribly shocking event. When we talk about sudden cardiac death in the young, uh, we've, we've defined it um, usually as less than 35 years of age, but of course these conditions, as Antonis just explained, can manifest at any time and go on manifesting into um, older age groups. It's just that if you look at sudden death over 35, you get an increasing proportion of ischemic heart disease. So quite a lot of studies are restricted to less than 35. And we usually consider um, SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, um, separately, although we do now know that up to 10% of SIDS may result from genes determined by um, channel offices. So sudden cardiac death in the young, it's a tragic, unexpected loss of someone young and it has uh, far-reaching effects in the family, in friends, and in the whole community, and leaves an enormous practical and psychosocial problems in its wake. Most actually occur during sleep or rest, but um, sometimes they can occur during exercise, um, and there is a whole um, day, I think, attributed to looking at sudden cardiac death in athletes. And when it does happen during a sporting event, it may cause even greater repercussions, particularly if it's a high profile player. And many of you will um, recognize this picture and remember the scenes that played out in the um, group matches of the Euros last year when uh, Christian Eriksen fell on the pitch and needed uh, resuscitation. Happily, happily, he was resuscitated and this wasn't a sudden death, but many um, athletes and footballers before him have not been able to be saved. Um, and the real importance here is that this is, this is often caused by potentially inheritable conditions and so it may not just be one death or one cardiac arrest in a family. Um, and that is why um, we focus our attention here and, and try and work out why the cause of death. So, I mean, just imagine being in this family, and I've changed it slightly, but it's it's very typical of a family we might care for. Um, this young man here, cardiac arrest, age 28 years, his family resuscitated him uh, and he made it through. 
Um, but very, very sadly, the next year, his brother, aged 27 years, also had a cardiac arrest and was not resuscitated. Um, so now we have two within the family. So there is an inherited condition going on here. We we were unable and remain unable to work out what that condition is. So can you imagine what it feels like for other brothers and sisters in this family approaching the age of uh, 26, 27? It's a very frightening thing. Um, and that's why we make every effort to, to help and uh, prevent um, deaths in family members. So what are the causes of sudden cardiac death in the young? Um, they've been nicely laid out here in this paper. Um, and you can see they've been split between, um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, between structural causes on this side and then arrhythmogenic causes or primary electrical diseases on the other side. And, and we usually lay it out in this fashion because the structural causes can very often be seen at autopsy. Um, whereas the channel offices leave no sign on autopsy. And depending on what population you're, you're looking at and what geography um, you've got um, and your methods, you can see that the etiology um, and the proportion of each individual disease slightly varies uh, between different studies. But on the whole, a large proportion is due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, you've got um, sudden unexplained death in there as well as um, a consistently a large proportion. So what are the people who are involved in uh, sudden cardiac death? Well, there's the coroner. The coroner is an independent official with legal responsibility. Um, and um, I was always taught, don't mess with the coroner. They have a lot of power. They've been around since the 11th century, and their duty is to investigate sudden and unexplained deaths so that the death can be certified and registered. And a doctor must be satisfied about the cause of death before they can certify it. If the doctor's not satisfied or did not examine the deceased at least 28 days before that death occurred, the death must be reported to the coroner. And the coroner must also be informed if the deceased dies as the result of an accident or in violent or unexplained circumstances. But the thing to remember is the coroner's inquiry, their first concern is establishing whether this is foul play or natural causes. And some of the recent work we've been doing is trying to work with um, coroners um, and their officers to say maybe um, you could extend that role to when a uh, sudden death looks like an inheritable condition to at least start signposting the family to the place they need to get to, which um, is the ICC service for further investigation. Who else have we got involved in the process? We've got the pathologist, a very important person in this process. And um, having been informed, the coroner will then ask for an autopsy. In England, this is a single observer um, and they need to have FRC PATH part two or a certificate of higher autopsy training. And um, they're very important because the standard of autopsy is essential uh, when we are investigating what caused a sudden death in a young person. I remember very well only a few years back, investigating the sudden death of a 14-year-old. She'd had syncope on a number of occasions, but she had a normal ECG and echo. And on her autopsy report was written acute pulmonary edema with chronic atrial fibrillation, which I'm afraid is neither adequate um, or accurate because there's no way you can diagnose atrial fibrillation um, once someone has died and there was nothing um, pre-mortem. So it's very important the standards of autopsy um, are good. So there's a lot of work going on presently with the guidelines on autopsy practice, particularly um, when a sudden death with likely cardiac pathology by the Royal College of Pathologists. And these standards have been um, revised and are out for consultation at the moment.
And so they set out um, the requirements of what should be looked at, the heart should be weighed, examination of uh, the various parts of the heart. But the important thing here is to um, this line here where it says there's a low threshold for taking relevant histological samples. Retention of the whole heart and sending it to a specialist centre for expert opinion should be considered, particularly if you're out of your depth. I mean, many people are very good at looking at the histology, so don't need to do that. Um, and, and the other thing that we're trying to add in is that tissue should be saved for a potential genetic molecular autopsy. And of course, this requires consent um, from the family, um, which, which is quite difficult because it, it's often asked for at a time when the family are in shock and grieving um, and probably not a subject they immediately want to focus on or, or possibly can focus on. So um, let's go back to our causes of sudden cardiac death. Um, and um, one of the things that um, I feel I should um, point out is that some of these here are not inheritable. Um, so myocarditis, probably not. Um, there's some sort of inheritance going on with both Parkinson's and White, but it's not a clear one, and neither with coronary anomalies. The rest of the courses of CLIC will focus in detail on aortic disease, um, the cardiomyopathies, uh, the arrhythmogenic causes. So I thought I'd just put a couple of slides in in these conditions, which um, are not inheritable, but you end up dealing with in the ICC service. So sudden cardiac death due to coronary artery anomalies actually quite common. It's it's in some studies been the second commonest cause of sudden cardiac death in, in athletes. And of course, you can see all sorts of arrangements um, when you look at someone's heart, um, as with everything else on the body. Um, but, and so there are guidelines issued by the Association for European Cardiovascular Pathology on what would um, be considered a cause of death and, and what just a variant of uh, normality. So for certain, an anomalous origin of a coronary artery from a pulmonary artery, this is um, something that we see in congenital heart disease because these infants become very, very sick early on in life um, and without surgery um, would, would die rapidly. Highly probable, though, is this condition, which we see in much older individuals, um, the origin of the left coronary artery from the right sinus, as shown here. Um, on the left of your picture. And then um, less certain are the right coronary artery from the left sinus and the left circumference from the right sinus. And of course, these very much depend on whether there's an intramural course of the coronary, a retroaortic course, etc. So these are up for discussion. The other thing that's uh, in that table is Wolf Parkinson White. And of course, Wolf Parkinson White really should be a structural problem um, that you could see, but um, very few autopsies really involve the very detailed histo histological work that you would need to find um, a pathway unless someone has alerted them uh, previously to um, a suspicion of this, such as the patient had had palpitations um, or had an ECG showing pre-excitation. This is pre-excitation in a 15-year-old. Um, and of course, this is pre-excited atrial fibrillation, which is the condition we believe uh, then um, causes them to collapse and can disintegrate to VF and cause a sudden death. Very happily, this 15-year-old was resuscitated in time and uh, we could ablate his pathway. This is a study um, by Susan Everidge um, from the US. Uh, she looked at a whole number of children and she found 96 who'd experienced life-threatening events and aged matched them with, 100 and, uh, with 816 children who had had Wolf Parkinson White but hadn't experienced a life-threatening event. It took some while with a whole number of centres contributing. And she looked at the various risk markers that, that we regularly measure in the cath lab to see if they were any good at um, risk stratification um, and 
telling us who we should be ablating and who we could leave alone. And really, they weren't very good. And very frighteningly, the mean age of life-threatening event was 14 plus or minus uh, four years. Um, and by life-threatening, it was pre-excited AF, aborted, sudden death, and 6% did die suddenly. So VF can occur in asymptomatic with Parkinson White and, and scarily was the sentinel event in, in 65%. So this is really driving our EP practice uh, in children. So you have a, a, a sudden death um, and um, what do you need to do in your ICC service? Um, really need to get as much information as possible about uh, the victim, about the person who has died. This, this can be difficult and, uh, you know, turns you into a bit of a Sherlock Holmes. You have to um, seek out the pre-morbid medical history. Did they have an ECG? Did, what, what investigations have they had, if any? A three-generation family history, all important. Um, and sometimes quite difficult to uh, attain on the first go. So that's a work in progress usually. And, and what they were actually doing at the time of death. And of course, for families, this can be extremely painful. Meanwhile, um, you're chasing up the autopsy report, considering a specialist cardiac autopsy if um, that hasn't been done, making sure consent and understanding is there to save tissue for a molecular autopsy and hopefully activating that. And this sort of investigation, I think, is best done in a multidisciplinary ICC service um, because it pulls in um, and requires all sorts of professionals um, who can help this family in this situation. And you're really going to target the first degree relatives, anyone with symptoms, understandably very anxious and, of course, obligate carriers. So a multidisciplinary inherited service, as you can see, um, you've got genetics, you've got um, EP people, you've got imaging, um, pathologists, nurses, counsellors, psychologists. It's a huge team of people uh, that can be um, employed in helping these families. Just looking how I'm doing for time, guys. Um, so um, you have a sudden death. Um, you've out you've ruled out other things um, and now you've got an autopsy which is positive and it's diagnosed perhaps hokum or myocarditis. Um, is it heritable? No. So you see the family but really the case is closed at that stage. If it's heritable of course then you go down the line of screening the first degree relatives, um, offering them screening and, and seeing if you can get a genetic uh, diagnosis as well. If it's autopsy negative, then you're in the realm of uh, sudden um, arrhythmic death syndrome, which is going to be due to one of the channelopathies, long QT, short QT, Brugada, CPVT. And in, in these situations, the molecular autopsy becomes um, all important. Um, you can screen the other family members, but you also really want to see if you can get genetic studies from the deceased DNA. And it's important for, for identifying further affected family members. Depends on tissue being saved um, and getting it this to the to the genetic lab in a you know good timing, but it also depends on consent. And, and the family being approached for appropriate consent. And then the accuracy it depends upon appropriate classification of genetic variants, and that is coming with increasing understanding. So this was a study um, we, we did based out of uh, St. George's, and we looked at um, the yield of genetic testing um, of um, people who had died of sudden um, unexplained cardiac death, SADS, 302 cases, next generation sequencing using a panel of 77 primary electrical and cardiomyopathy genes actually because we did find some cardiomyopathy genes even though the autopsy was negative. And we found a clinically actionable pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in 13%. And if you added that in with clinical evaluation of surviving families where we mainly find 
CPVT, Brugada and Long QT, um, you, you find a diagnosis in up to 39%. So strategies for tackling sudden cardiac death in the young are a bit wider. We really need to look at improved recognition of these diseases. We can still do better. Better risk stratification, very difficult thing to do, as Antonis said, uh, looking into the future. Implementation of screening, and I think Nabil is going to um, talk about that next. Improved resuscitation from out of hospital cardiac arrest. There's been huge work, uh, particularly with the Football Association, but in all venues now, uh, making increased accessibility to public defibrillators and um, educational educational programs which have been fantastic in raising awareness. Tightening autopsy standards, increasing the availability of genetic testing and encouraging molecular autopsy in every case. And so finally, um, things to take home. Sudden cardiac death can occur in young people without herald and the consequences are far reaching. Many of these deaths are caused by a possible inheritable condition, so really important we understand the cause of death, not only to allow closure for that family, but to inform screening of the family and prevent any further events in that family. Families should be evaluated in a multidisciplinary ICC service, uh, but I'm very open for the hub and spoke model, and I'm sure that's the way um, that's going to work for, for patients in the future. Autopsy of suspected victims should include histology and the option for tissue to be saved offered to the family. Um, a molecular autopsy should be offered in every case as long as the family has consented. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. That's um, really great coverage of a, a topic that's very difficult, especially it's a very traumatic time for the families of people who have been um, affected by someone with sudden cardiac death. Um, we do want to hear more about the uh, the pathway that you're working on in conjunction, I understand, with the BHF to try and streamline the process of connecting families with cardiac, uh, inherited cardiac um, condition services. And um, I hope that you'll be able to join us and tell us a little bit more about that in the panel discussion at, um, at 2.50 because um, there's lots of very exciting work that you're doing that that I think will be uh, uh, very helpful for our attendees to to hear about. Um, so uh, thank you so very much again and looking forward to hearing more from you shortly.